just three ordinary guys trying to understand the crazy world around them. We don't have all the answers, but we've got all the questions. You're listening to Just Add Bourbon with Jimmy, JD, and Brad. Welcome, everybody, to the other side of the glass, the Facebook Live series brought to you from the Just Add Bourbon podcast. My name is Jimmy Don Kerr. I'm Brad Broadus. And I'm J.D. Darren. And we've been trying to have people come on with us on Thursdays, sit down and talk a, a wide variety of topics. We've had on politicians. We've had on motivational speakers. And tonight, our guest is Timothy Van Riper, contributing writer for ModernThirst.com. Uh, Timothy lived in Southern California most of his life, and although he drank bourbon for a good amount of those years, it wasn't until he moved to Louisville that he really jumped into the bourbon head first. He's always been incredibly fascinated with what bourbon has to offer and what goes into making a great bottle of whiskey from the earth that birthed the beautiful oak for its barrels to the grain that shines through when it first hits your lips. And this may be the greatest line ever. He wants to learn everything there is to know and then drink it. Timothy, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, y'all. It's uh. Glad to be here. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, boys, I was sitting here and I was reading a little bit about Modern Thirst, and and one thing really came to my mind, and it was Brad and I may need to relook at our career paths because we've made a, an error somewhere <laughs> when when this when this kind of opportunity is here. And JD, JD is a laid off coal miner, Timothy, and I think we have found a new career path. <laughs> For Brother J.D. <laughs> when you said awesome. head first in the bourbon, I was like, that doesn't sound like a bad plan at all. <laughs> <laughs> so, Timothy, just tell us a little bit about yourself, man, where you come from and, and yeah, uh, how, you got, how um, you got into this business. So, um, I, I think, so I've always, I've always been, I've always been a bourbon drinker. Um, I think the bourbon, it's funny, the bourbon that really did it for me, I was, 21 or 22 years old and I was at a friend's house and his uncle had opened a 1959 old crow like jug like a handle and I remember making a big deal about it because it was was still closed still had the tax stamp and blah 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 and he was just like fuck that we're opening it and then I just I fell in love and so I've been drinking bourbon ever since but didn't really find out about single barrels until I moved here um I'm actually a, a barber by trade. I've been barbering for probably about seven years um, at a barbershop in California. And a, and a big thing that we did was we had, we served beer and bourbon alongside with your haircut. So, the, you know, that kind of, you know, kept the, kept the flame and the passion going for it. And then getting here, uh, landed in Louisville, she's a little bit over three and a half years now. And my wife knew that I was really into bourbon and uh, a gift that she gave me in the airport, which I'm sure it was expensive in hell. I got to, got to drink the entire uh, vertical of Patty Van Winkle. And I remember, wow. yeah, right. Killer, killer woman. But I remember drinking through it and getting like halfway and was like, what's the big deal? And my bartender came over and he goes, so what's your favorite single barrel? And I was like, what the hell is a single barrel? And he kind of just chuckled, walked away, and came back with a bottle of Old Granddad Bonded, which, looking back on it now, is kind of funny because why the hell did he ask me what my favorite single barrel was and then pour me Old Granddad Bonded? <laughs> and he said, have fun on your single barrel journey. So that that's where the whole single barrel snob came thing uh, idea came from because I, I would say like 90 to 95% of everything that's behind me is all – a single barrel expression. And yeah, that's, that's where a lot of my love for bourbon comes from uh, in general. Now is just uh, a single barrel and how that expression can be so different than what you can normally find on the shelf and just pull things out of it that you would never expect to show up in bourbon at all. So before so we go of... any further, JD, and I know you got a question before we go any further, I need, we need to backtrack just a second. So did you tell me, <laughs> did you tell me that, you were a barber by trade, and you would actually cut hair and serve bourbon at the barbershop. Did I hear that right? Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. The Eastern Kentucky Barbers going to step their game up. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually – it's actually something I've been looking into, and there is – there's a lot of red tape and a lot of loopholes that uh, – I don't think I don't think everyone's ready for yet. There's well, I mean, you got sharp instruments and liquor, you know, what I'm, and and uh, whiskey. I mean, I, it might not be I get a bad it. combo. I get it. And then plus, everyone needs the cut of their cut of the of the pie, right? Everybody not needs sure. their tax, and so that's that's really the big thing that I'm running into is that everybody needs needs that. So right, that's yeah. like everything, JD. Yeah. So I want you to step back again, man, because I want you talking to me like I don't know nothing about bourbon. Because you know what? I don't know a whole lot. I don't know if I drink enough of it. I get a good little buzz. <laughs> so when you're talking about single barrel, like is that just is bourbon just I'm I'm guessing so, so, so yeah, I don't know. So generally bourbon is all done in a batch, right? Um you'll have things that say like this Elijah Craig says small batch. Yeah. So there's no legal definition of what a small batch actually has to be. So let's say a typical batch of Elijah Craig is three hundred barrels. And they decide, well, let's do a small batch and we'll do 299 barrels. It's a little facetious, but it's, it's, there's no legal definition of what a small batch has to be. So all, almost all your bourbon is blended on however many barrels they decide takes to make up the profile of that said bourbon. So you have a consistent flavor profile every single time you open a bottle, regardless. That's the whole thought. So single barrel bourbon is that one barrel and everything inside that barrel is getting bottled and that's it. That's, and that's a single barrel. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. I didn't know that. So is there like with the, with the single barrel and, and what makes the price go up on that? Is it, does it have more to do with quality or is it just the scarcity? Uh, I think it's a combination of both, to be honest, you, you, you know, especially if you have somebody who's really renowned for picking an incredible barrel, that's also going to come, you know, with a lot of, with a lot of a bigger price tag, as far as like, let's say a resale value. Uh, generally, uh, when you see a big markup on, on a single barrel, it's a lot of the times it's just because. But most of the time, you'll see a slight markup, and that's just because it's costing a little bit more more money to curate that entire barrel than it would be to like buy five cases of it. So you'll see like a like let's say like a five to ten dollar increase in a standard expression versus a single barrel expression. Hmm. So I, I was reading something on the website. Yeah, man. And again, I don't know a ton about it, but I thought this was interesting. And it says, let's face it, drinking is a hobby, an art, and a way of life. And in some circles, it's also a sport. Now, I never viewed, you know, drinking bourbon as any of those things, except maybe a sport sometimes. <laughs> sure. But so can you uh, kind of take me through each one of those, like drinking as a hobby? Like what is – what would be the hobby of drinking? I would say a hobby would be finding finding rare and limited expressions and and looking for them or chasing them or you know indulging everything you have into that certain thing, whether it be like um, a bourbon from um, a single let's say a bourbon from a single entity where there'd be like uh, a private barrel or picked by a specific person or a bourbon that's from a certain era. Um, I've had bourbon as far back from the forties. So, you know, forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, any time, any time area era. And uh, yeah, there's uh, actually, there's a, there's a, there's a really good example. Uh, Fred Minnick collects bourbon prior to 1964 because 1964 was when bourbon became 100% American made. So prior to 1964, there, bourbon was being made more or less all over the world and being called bourbon. So he has a few things in his collection that he seeks out and looks for is stuff that's pre-1964 and still being called bourbon. So like Mexican bourbon or you know Norwegian bourbon or whatever. So that's kind of an example of it being a hobby. 
So what about as an art? Oh man, an art. That's a that's a tough one. Um, is it? I mean, maybe it's the way the bottle is designed, or maybe the. I mean, I don't know. I was just trying to. It could be. I mean, it could. It could be. It could be interpreted as you're searching for stuff that that comes in a really cool bottle. Right. That's that's a that's a hard one to interpret exactly. But and then obviously the way of life. I mean, it's you know you've made a career out of it, right? I mean, it is. It clearly could be a way of life as far sure. as you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, not, not quite where I need to be, where I feel like I can do it a hundred percent and feel comfortable, but definitely, uh, definitely working my way there. And then, and really, I mean, I, I was joking when I said it's a sport, but is there really a sport? I mean, are there people who make their own bourbon and, you know, and they compete? There is, uh, probably for a good year, a year ago. It went through, kind of filtered through all the groups that I was in of doing bottle chugs and whoever could do the biggest and the longest bottle chug. Pretty stupid being a grown ass man, but it was a lot of fun. JD, this is right up your alley, dude. I'm telling you, we have found a clear path. I'm thinking maybe this is something JD could possibly go to the Olympics. (laughs) Yeah, dude. There you go. There you go. I mean, I'll expand on that a little bit. He's talking about it being a sport. We're in, Timothy and I are in a, uh, Burber finder group on Facebook, and like it's almost competitive who can find, you know, the unicorns out there, the you know the best deals on this bourbon stuff. So it's oh, really yeah. a group. I really enjoy being in that group. Like I've learned, you know, a lot. Continue to learn more. So I got one question for you, Tim. Yeah, man, what's up? So like, you arrive from California, you come, you fly into Louisville, and your wife buys you this Pepe Van Winkle and sends you on this journey. Like, so kind of tell me. You know, once you left the airport, how'd that journey continue after that? Like, uh, did you get involved? I know you got some uh, certifications and stuff like that. Like, kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, so I am, um, I'm what you call bourbon steward certified. If you look up at the Stephen Thieves Society, uh, it's basic, basically just like a mark next to your name and uh, makes you stand out a little bit more. I don't want to say it's unnecessary, but it definitely it definitely taught me a whole lot and helped me learn a whole lot more and kind of showed me how to curate things for individuals when they were wanting, wanting to either learn about whiskey or do a fly to whiskey. It, it just made it more, it made it more approachable for other people, I, I guess you could say. Um, and that was, geez, I think I've been certified for about a year now. And I mean, there's other, there's other classes and things that you can do. There's a, a school out of Texas. Um, I think it's called the wizard Academy and they have a bourbon. I'm going to say this in quotations, sommelier program. And it's essentially just like a marketing school. It's like, it's a, it's a more advanced and aggressive version of what the Stephen Thieves society is. And it's just, it's just training you uh, how to run your business or you know a personality or whatever and teach teach people and show people about tastings it it, is essentially what that is brad you have a question yeah on on the on the whiskey bourbon thing you know we we, we've always been led to believe that that all whiskey is made in tennessee and all bourbons made in kentucky and uh, just looking at some stuff on on whiskey, you know, it looks like it might go back to ancient Mesopotamia or whatever. And I think bourbon is is made a number of places now. So, how did we get tagged as as Tennessee being whiskey and Kentucky being, being bourbon? It's because we're so, awesome and Tennessee sucks. That's why. <laughs> the the real reason that Tennessee isn't bourbon is because it doesn't want to be. Uh, it, it was it originally started out as a marketing ploy so they could kind of stand out and stand stand apart from the whole I guess you could say bourbon scene uh, but it is now actually a legal uh, term to be Tennessee whiskey so that's that's the difference there but as far as being called bourbon you can as long as it's American made it can be bourbon from anywhere you can have bourbon from Hawaii it's, it's American made doesn't matter 
as long as it's made in the States and it follows all the legal requirements to be bourbon, it's bourbon. But Kentucky more or less does have the best bourbon. That's right. <laughs> we talked about, you know, being in that bourbon group and people looking for the unicorns and stuff like that. So do you have a unicorn out there that you've not tasted? Is there something? Oh, man. You know, like, I, I don't know a whole lot about it, man. I'm just getting into it. I didn't even try Blanton's yet. So, like, I, I'm excited. To, like, I would overpay for some Blanton's right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will say this, I am, I'm extremely blessed in the position that I have that coincides with writing and talking about whiskey. I run a tasting bar here at a local um, a liquor store. And so I get to try a lot of really awesome bourbon. And I'm a little jaded on what I think about things. Um, I think Blanton's is extremely overrated for one. And, you know, that's, I don't need to start a dumpster fire or piss a bunch of people off, but that's just my personal opinion. As far as, <laughs> as far as something that I'm like, oh man, what's, what's my, I would say my unicorn right now would be in 1984, which is the year I was born. A 1984 wild turkey. Um, wild turkey in, I think it was like, 82 to 90 oh geez i think like mid 90s i don't know i want to say 92 or 94 they had this thing that was called cheesy gold foil it was basically just this really lame gold foil around the top of the bottle and it is i've had a few i've had like a 92 and an 88 but i haven't had one from my actual birth year yet so that that would be i think that's the thing that i'm like i need to find that that's my that's my definite unicorn at the moment so is there like, you know, just like say wild turkey, is there a distinct difference in the taste from a 1982 to a 1996? You know, oh, yeah. Really? Oh, absolutely. Oh, my God. Yeah. I, I, I hate to be that person and be like, this tastes totally different. But it it, <laughs> it, it really does. And and until until you actually get to try it, it's really hard to it's really hard to pinpoint why and what it actually is and i i mean still to this day i've drank like i said the oldest thing that i've drank so far is from 1941 and i don't know why it tastes different i mean you could literally when it comes to bourbon you could factor anything like the soil plays in to that the you know where the wood came from the air pollution everything everything is a factor when you analyze bourbon from a certain area versus bourbon now so there is kind of like a mystique to a 1940. Oh, I guess you'll you'll see that do a lot with wine too, right? You know, there's a 1940 oh, sure. whatever. Yeah, sure. And so there's just something to maybe a bottle that has survived that long and not been opened. Does it? Is there anything in the process, like the way that it ages, that changes the taste? Is there something that gets better? Is there anything like that? Um, Outside of it not being sealed properly and it, it and possibly oxidizing over time, there's not really anything as far as like in the bottle that's going to be different. Because as soon as as soon as it ends, as soon as it exits that barrel and goes into a bottle, it's done aging. It doesn't. Okay. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't really get any more characteristics like wine does. It's not wine's essentially alive, and wine's going to keep progressing as time goes however however much of life is left in that wine after it's bottled it's going to keep going so it's it wine's essentially alive whiskey not really it's going to oxidize and it will change maybe a little bit but other than that it's not it's not the, there's a whole, a whole lot not a whole lot that's going to happen to it jd do you have a question yeah so i'm gonna talk about tastings a little bit like so what is that like 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 you said you we talked about being on zoom you was like oh i do zoom tastings all the time so like how does that work like uh I mean, is it just like wine? You put it in your mouth and slosh it around, or, or is it, how's <laughs> it go? Is bourbon? Um, how, how does it? How does it go? As far as like, how does the tasting go, or like how I curate it, or sure, both. Yeah, a good okay, question. Sure. All the above. <laughs> um, so I've done it a few ways. I've done it to like, we're gonna taste these bottles, and this is where these bottles are available. So go and pick these bottles up, and we're gonna drink them and talk about them. I've also done it uh, on a way where I. I picked like five whiskeys and I said, these are the five whiskeys that we're going to taste. And I sent samples out to however many people. And then there's just been things where it was just, you know, 
a context kind of like this and just hanging out and drinking whiskey and talking about it. And everyone's drinking something different and everyone's, everyone's talking about different things about what they're drinking. As, as far as, as far as tastings go, um, tastings and tasting notes, there's really no wrong answer as far as when it comes to tasting notes. Uh, one of the big things that I try to stress and I talk to, I talk to people about is there's no wrong answer. And if you're tasting or smelling something, shout it out because I'm not going to make fun of you. I'm going to make sure as hell no one here is going to make fun of you either. Um, and, and there's a few things, you know, there's a few things you want to follow, you know, nosing it, you know, nosing it from side, side to side, nosing it in the front, making sure your mouth's open, um, letting the whiskey sit on your palate, moving the whiskey around your mouth. I mean, there's, there's, as far as that goes, there is kind of a science to it, but essentially all you're doing is just making sure it's hitting every every spot of your palate and you're tasting it to its full capability that's that's really all it is so really there is a thing to like smelling this way and then this way and you know and the way you do it you can actually i mean that actually goes into it like i can see me and jd sitting around and say you know i taste a hint of oak you know (laughs) <laughs> something like that jd would be making fun of me while i did it but i mean as far as there really is that process of actually smelling it and trying to get mm. all your senses and, and getting the absolutely. whole thing absolutely um yeah no 100 percent. it's a, a few times when i'm doing live tastings and i'm talking about it i usually hit a point in the back of my head where i feel really dumb and, and it's more i feel a little pretentious because of the things i'm picking up um, but I'm just saying what's coming to mind. Like if I smell something and it reminds me of something, I'm going to shout it out. I'm going to say it. It's, it's, yeah, it's, so I kind of, I kind of give myself shit a lot of times too, but <laughs> that's, where I live hey, my man, life. that's just, that's just part of it. That's just part of it. Like people are going to laugh because, because of one of two things, but they're either laughing at the shit you said because it's funny or they're laughing because they probably picked that up too. So there's, there's yeah, there's so many there's so many little things that go into it. Here's a here's a let's see, here's a basic actually this is a little more complex. Here's a tasting wheel. Um I don't always use tasting wheels. Uh but you know, there'll be sometimes when I'm I'm smelling something and I can't quite pull out what's going on going on with it. So I'll pull out a tasting wheel and try to help me help me along. And then the other thing too is, um, you know, your nose and your palate is it, 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 it's more or less like a muscle, you know, and it's 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 creating that muscle memory. You know, you go to the gym and you work out your biceps, and over time they get bigger and you get stronger. Well, it's kind of the same thing that's going on with your nose and your palate. The more that you're able to identify what marshmallows smell like. And you can be like, yeah, that's marshmallows right there. I know what marshmallows smell like 100%. The more you're going to be able to pick things up. So it's just, it's just, it's taking in the information. And it's not that those smells and nuances that are inside this glass, it's that you smell it and it reminds you of that. That's really all it comes down to. Well, that was actually you answered my question because I was going to ask that. It's like, you know, yourself, you've already drank, always drank bourbon, but as you've gotten older and you've been able to taste more, did your palate change or almost become more sensitive to those tastes, you know, as far as what you were picking up. So that's pretty cool. Actually. That yeah, your, would... palate's, your palate's always going to change at, at some point. It's going to, it's, it's going to, it's going to change one way or another. Um, but if I, if I told you, if I picked up this glass and I go, Oh man, I'm really getting lychee fruit in this right now. Have you guys ever smelled lychee fruit? Do you even know what the hell lychee fruit is? I don't. (laughs) And then how the hell are you going to know what the hell lychee fruit smells like? And if you're picking up in the bourbon. (laughs) So that's the big thing is, is really like, and that's, that's an exaggerated, that's an exaggerated uh, explanation of it. But, you know, seeking things out, like someone goes, man, I'm really getting Madagascar vanilla in this. Okay. Well, what the hell does Madagascar vanilla smell like? go find some Madagascar vanilla and smell it. And then you'd be like, okay, cool. Now I know what that smells like. And now I can look for that scent 
or look for that, you know, smell or taste when I'm, when I'm tasting bourbon or when I'm smelling bourbon or when I'm doing a tasting. Brad. So do they, do they ever have a contest like, you know, the double blind um, where there's a group of the experts and you're blindfolded and you're drinking and you have to guess what it is. Or I guess my point is if you took a lot of the people that you would consider to be bourbon snobs and you put something different, uh, in the wrong bottle, would they be able to tell? I'm going to say yes and no. Um, your 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 palate and what you're smelling can be easily influenced, especially if you already know what that smell or taste is, can easily be influenced by someone if I go, man, this smells like Skittles. And you go, oh, crap, man, it does smell like Skittles. So, like, now <laughs> I'm just influenced what you're smelling. So, in that aspect, sure. If I had a bottle of 23-year-old Pappy Van Winkle and I poured it for you, but inside it's really just, like, old old uh, Fitzgerald shelf for 80 proof, and I'm pouring and telling you it's Pappy Van Winkle 23 year, there might be some people who go, oh, man, this is the best thing I ever tasted. But Pappy Van Winkle 23 year is very oak forward, very tannic. So there's going to be some people that be like, nah, man, this is not what you say it is. Or something got messed up. Or So I think it just kind of depends. Um... Yeah, I don't know. That's it. I really like doing blind tastings, uh, not because I like to trick people, but because when you don't really know what you're drinking and you're just drinking it and you're tasting it and you're like, I like this period. I don't care what it is. I like it at this time and point right now. I think that's all. I think that's a lot of fun. I was doing, I was doing a tasting for a couple. It was probably about a year or so ago. I was doing a tasting for a couple and they're picking bourbon for their wedding. And they came, they, they tasted through like five or six whiskeys and they came down to, they wanted to have, a weeded bourbon as part of their lineup. And one of one of my probably not my favorite, but definitely one that I, I try to introduce people to is David Nicholson eighteen forty three, which is a, a younger, it's probably like a four year old weeded whiskey. Um just to give context, weeded whiskey, uh Pappy Van Winkle is really famous for being weeded whiskey. That's kind of like the weeded bourbon that everyone chases. So weeded bourbon, if you say weeded bourbon, people usually associate that with either Weller or Pappy Van Winkle. So I kind of like, you know, throw something out there a little bit different for people to try. So I pull out this bottle and say, hey, you guys should have this in your wedding. You know, it's really, it's, it's readily available. It's inexpensive and it's delicious. And they're like, absolutely not, not going to happen. It's garbage. $20 is too little of an amount to pay for a bottle to have at our wedding. So that's fine. No worries. So we're kind of talking a little bit more and they're talking about some other weeded whiskeys. And when they're not looking, I grab two glasses and filled it up with 1843 and just let them talk a little bit more. And I said, you know what? I have one more whiskey that you guys need to chase. I already poured it and I set it down in front of them. And right away, the guy is like, oh, this is so complex and so robust. And this is, this is just a spectacular whiskey. What is it? Pull the bottle down, pull the bottle up, set it down in front of them. 1843. Oh, fuck you. <laughs> not trying to, I'm not trying to trick you, but. I also kind of am because a label, a lot of times labels, people have a certain association with that label and they're instantly turned off as soon as they see it. It doesn't matter if you, if it's gray whiskey or not, you pour it in front of them and they have a negative notation to that whiskey. They're not going to like it. So that's why I really like blinds. That's the biggest thing I like about blind whiskey. That leads me to my question a little bit, man, about marketing in the bourbon industry. You know, I found it. You know, you never ever turn on the TV or the radio and hear any marketing at all for bourbon. But there's almost like a subculture of people who keep the bourbon industry just rolling along. And like, so there's the only thing I can think of that's really marketing is, is Blanton's with their, uh, you know, the race horse. Uh, yeah. Sure. So, can I speak to that a little bit? Like, uh, you know, the marketing that goes on in the bourbon industry, you know, and, and, and the non marketing that goes on, it keeps the, but the industry stays robust. Man, that's, that's, that's a really good question. Um, 
a lot of, I would say a lot of, not a lot of, let's say, let's say a decent amount of, I guess that culture and that marketing, it kind of comes from celebrity, a celebrity influence. More specifically, um, Anthony Bourdain, really for like, man, like a good year or two, really went gun ho about saying, Pappy Van Winkle was the best whiskey that you could buy, and you should be drinking that on a regular basis, and yada, yada, yada. So that, that kind of started the ball rolling in the direction of, I have to drink this bourbon. And then another thing is there's just some bourbons that just look fantastic on film, and this is one of them. Yeah, Blanton's. I know I talked shit about this earlier, but this is actually a single barrel pick um, from a local a local here in town. Um, his name's Larry Rice, and he owns um, a place called Silver Dollar and uh, the Pearl of Germantown. And he has a spectacular palate, and he really knows how to pick an awesome barrel. And this is just fantastic. But this bottle... Uh, you will see this show up in a lot of movies, a lot of TV. It just looks really good. Like it's sitting back on a shelf. Sure. This bottle looks awesome. And that kind of goes back to the art that we were talking about earlier. Something like that goes to the art. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and so that has, has a lot to do with it too. Like um, this bottle really, really showed up in uh, John Wick. It was like the first time, not the first time, but I I would say probably one of the, the times where it really, really got big. And popular what you got there oh a little buffalo trace hell yeah dude there you go there you go <laughs> um but yeah you know you have you know you have a, a fan following to a movie and let's say that that character is is really you know gun-ho about a particular brand most people are going to go find and drink that brand too because the movie the character in the movie that they saw is drinking that brand too so that has that has a lot to play in it too um Overall, it's just it's popular right now. It's it's riding that wave of popularity, and, and people want to drink. People want to drink it. You know, it, it, you can go back to like I think it was, say like mid to late '90s, where everyone was drinking, you know, vodkas and gins and cocktails because that's what was hot. Like, you know, vodka was huge, but that was that's just the time. Hmm. Hey, Timothy, one of our viewers asked the question, and he his question was, those for those that are on a budget, mm-hmm. what, in your opinion, is the best bourbon, mm-hmm. and they have 750 milliliters for under $30? So a little bit is going to depend on where you're at. Um, I'll show you two whiskeys that are Kentucky only, and one that I think is pretty much readily available – um, across the states. JD, is that your dream behind him right there? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so that's later on tonight. J- that was here. <laughs> <laughs> JTS Brown bottled in bond. This is a Kentucky only release. Where's that out of? Uh, Where's Kentucky Browns? What is that? This is this is from Heaven Hill. Okay. This is Heaven Hill bottled in bond. Do you guys know what bottled in bond is? Nope. Cool. Well, we'll we'll take a little sidestep really quick. So, prior to 1897, whiskey was really popular. There was really a lot of money to be made. So there was a lot of people creating, I guess you would say, counterfeit whiskey. And they were taking whiskey and watering it down or taking, you know, moonshine and adding tobacco juice or prune juice or battery acid, anything to give it the look, feel, and color and bite of whiskey, but not actually being whiskey. Uh, it's where the term, have you ever heard the term rock gut whiskey? Yes. Okay. That's yes. where that term kind of came from because people were legitimately dying from drinking this whiskey. So the government stepped in. This is the first time that the government has ever stepped in. And it was actually nine years before the food and drug act, drug act started. And uh, the government said, okay, we're going to create bonded whiskey. If you see a bottle and you see that it says bonded, you're going to know that it's at least 100 proof. It's coming from one distiller in one distillery season from one master distiller. It's aged in a government bonded warehouse that's regulated, and it's at least four years old. And so you knew if you were out shopping for whiskey 
and you saw bonded that it was basically a seal of quality and you weren't going to die from from drinking whiskey so that is the bottle and bond act so you have jts brown bottled and bond this is a kentucky only release from heaven hill uh used to be around nine or ten bucks that you could get this bottle for it has gone up slightly in price because heaven hill caught wind of what we were doing and it's it's now it's around 15 or 16 bucks but another great pour great pour for under 20 bucks uh another one you have old bardstown bottled and bond this is from the willet distillery and this is also a kentucky only release Awesome, awesome bottle. Uh, around $22, $23, depending on where you go. And then finally, this is probably like a nationwide release. This is J.W. Dant. This is from the Heaven Hill Distillery. Around $15 or $16, or $16 and it's also bonded. Uh, those are those are my top three. I have one more, but it's over here. I got to grab it. Do you guys feel like... Every time we talk to somebody, I'm like, I'm not such an idiot. <laughs> well, no, I, earlier I was no. like, this, uh, Timothy thinks he, it, Timothy has to feel like he's talking to a bunch of kindergartners right now. Not at all. No, <laughs> I, I, but I, I am love, so fascinated by this right now. I love whiskey and I don't care on what platform or what level it's on. I love talking about it. And I've never, I've never once thought, my God, I just, I enjoy talking about it. It's fun. I don't care. I don't care where your, your knowledge or your experiences in whiskey. I just, I love talking about it. And then finally, uh, this is early times bottled in bond. This is available probably about eight States. Um, Kentucky is obviously one of them. I don't know all of them offhand, but you get a liter for around 27 or $28. Another great buy. Um, a few others that I actually don't have here in my bar because I'm out of would be David Nicholson Reserve, which is a high rye bourbon. That's like a five to seven year old high rye bourbon. That's around 30 bucks. Um, David Nicholson 1843, which is a uh, <laughs> which is a weeded bourbon. I, I, I like Buffalo Trace. I think Buffalo Trace is really really buttery, really uh, really sweet. Lots of vanilla. Buffalo Trace is great. Oh, you can get it for around. If you can get it around for thirty bucks, hell yeah, yeah dude! All I was gonna throw bucks for this thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, what's another one I like? Uh, Rebel Yell One Hundred. That's another great young weeded bourbon, hundred proof. Uh, that's around twenty five bucks. Oh man, what else? What else? Uh, Old Fitzgerald. That's a just their eighty proof expression. That's another good young weeded bourbon. Also, probably around twenty twenty five bucks. Uh, my biggest thing, my biggest thing is is is, is explore, don't be afraid to explore the bottom shelf, especially when they're under twenty bucks. Wow. Because if you don't like it, shit, pour it out, make a cocktail out of it, or give it to your buddy. Like you don't have to keep it. If you don't like it, get rid of it. Fuck it. It was under twenty bucks. Yeah. But really, don't don't be afraid to explore. That's 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 the big thing. That's how I found out. I mean, really, how I found out about these was, I mean, there's a where I'm from. Here in Louisville, this has a huge fan following. So people were talking about this all the time. And I was like, I really need to grab a bottle of this and find out what the heck's going on. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, these all four of those that I just showed, initially my attraction to it was, oh man, this is really affordable. I really need to check this out. So yeah, don't be afraid of the bottom shelf. There's a lot of really great things on the bottom shelf. There's a lot of really bad things on the bottom shelf though too. So once again, if you don't like it, no biggie. Get rid of it and start over. Eric, when you come in, I, we're going to have a bottle of JTS Brown waiting on you. We're going to try it there out. There you go. There you go. Go ahead, Brad. Well, obviously, you you know a lot about uh, the history. Um, so as you were learning about the history of, of bourbon, whiskey, the whole thing, what, what was one of the most interesting or crazy stories – uh, something that you learned that our, our listeners may have never heard before. Oh man. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's crazy, but it is kind of interesting and entertaining. Um, as far as like where bourbon, like the name bourbon or where bourbon came from or where it originated, there's at least three or four stories that people follow. And it's like, 
I was the originator of bourbon, and that's the end of that. I, I find that kind of entertaining. It's like everyone's kind of like combative and trying to figure out, uh, you know, who really started it. And I don't care. If it's good, let's drink it. <laughs> and then um, the other thing that I found was really interesting was uh, when bourbon first became American made, uh, I was just kind of always the impression that bourbon was American and that's just the way it went. Um, so finding out that there was other um, locations that were making bourbon, I thought was really interesting too. I think that's pretty cool. Hey, Timothy, we had one of the, we have another question from one our yeah, viewer. Um, and the question from Jennifer Ward is, have you heard of Caleb Kilburn? Caleb Kilburn. She is, says he, he just won an international award for his distilling. And she said she didn't remember yes, which company, Caleb, but she thought he was out Caleb, of Louisville. Caleb is the master distiller for Peerless. Uh, Peerless is actually a local Louisville distillery. Um, they've been doing whiskey for about, I'd say, three or four years now. Um, they just recently released bourbon, which is kind of an interesting thing because they haven't done bourbon under the Peerless name in over 100 years. And now Caleb just recently released um, just recently released bourbon. Um, I, Caleb, Caleb, not frequently, but every once in a while, he'll come to the liquor store where I work at. And this was right before they were going to release their bourbon. And I remember I looked at him and I said, Hey, Caleb, when are you going to release your bourbon? And he said, when it's ready. And I think that is such a solid answer. You know, there's not, you're not putting a time frame on it. You're not putting any limitations to it. When you taste it and it tastes right, that's when it's going to get bottled. So this might be a really dumb question, but I'm going to ask it. Anyway. No, no dumb, no dumb questions. No so, dumb questions. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not feeling. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some bourbon that you'll drink or whiskey or whatever it is, and you know you'll you'll drink it. You make the pucker face, followed by a Ric Flair woo, and then <laughs> there's and then there's some that you drink it and you're just like, man, that is really smooth. Like why? I mean, what makes that difference? Do you? I mean, is there an answer to that question that sure. makes? Oh that no, difference? absolutely. So it's it's kind of it's kind of a two part thing. It's it's I think it kind of depends on how much whiskey you've drank prior, and if you're at what some people will call at proof. So you've been drinking long enough, and your palate is finally adjusted. Because when you drink whiskey, a lot of it is your palate's kind of going into shock, and it's like whoa crap, like basically whoa, like that's kind of what your palate's doing. So, you know, you finally, you've been drinking long enough so your palate's no longer doing that. So you're, you're able to taste everything that's going on. I feel like Brad and Jimmy, um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another thing that kind of plays into that is proof. Uh, where it's at, you know, is it is it right at the legal limit? Is it 80 proof or is it 144 proof? And then uh, the final thing is going to be the rye content the rye content in your bourbon has a lot to do and that spice and that, um, I guess, burn you could call that you're getting from it. So um, like Heaven Hill, Heaven Hills are a really good low rye uh, bourbon. If it, you know, if you're curious and you, you want to start drinking bourbon uh, and, and you want to get past that, Oh, this is too hot or, Oh, it's not smooth. There's plenty of there's plenty of higher proof bourbons. They're still smooth, and it's and it's mainly because they have a lower rye content. So, so I wanted to ask you like about the writing, the writing aspect of this. Like, how did you get into the writing? Were you writing before? And oh then, man, go ahead. Um, sort of. So I've always been I've always been kind of intrigued and interested in writing. Um, I kind of just did it on the side as my own thing because I thought it was so much fun. I, this is the first time that I've ever actually gone, I guess you could say mainstream with my writing, uh, mainly because uh, I'm extremely dyslexic and I always got told that I was dumb and I was never going to be able to do anything because of it. So I never really did. I kind of just did it on the side because I enjoyed it and I never, never really went anything past that. Um, the guy who owns Modern Thirst, Bill Strop, I met him at a 
um, private tasting that he was doing. I think it was probably about a year and a half ago. And something compelled me to go and talk to him. I said, I don't know what it is, but I have to go talk to this guy. I have to talk to him about whiskey. And that's just the end of story. I don't know why, but I have to go talk to him. So I went and talked to him. I was like, hey, man, how do I do what you do? And he kind of like took a step back and was like, okay. I was like, I don't want to take over what you're doing. I just want to do what you're doing with you. And he's like, actually, we're looking for a new writer. Why don't you come write for me? And I was like, absolutely not. Not going to happen. No way in hell. I can't write. I'm an idiot. Blah, 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 blah. Probably sat on that for like two or three weeks until he was like, hey, man, what's going on? Are you going to write for me? Are you going to send me a, a, you know, a, a test piece? Blah, 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 blah. And finally, I just said, fuck it. I wrote up, uh, you know, like probably like a three or four paragraph thing on uh, some whiskey and send it to him. And he said, cool, man, you uh, you write for us now. And I was like, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> so it was legitimately just like, for whatever reason, I had to go talk to this guy. And now I write for Modern Thirst. It, it was it was really as simple as that. That's cool. JD, do you have a question? I mean, I did. But first off, I want to commend you, man, for stepping outside your comfort box and, and doing that. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know that's not an easy thing to do. Appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. Experience that, you know, with – Especially being on Zoom, right? <laughs> oh yeah, sure, sure. Uh, but like, when you come home to evening, it's like, how do you decide like which whiskey you want to kick back and sip on that evening? Oh man, I think I think a big factor is that kind of depends on how, how what kind of day that I have. There's some days when I get home and I really just need a fucking shot, and I just need to sit and sip something, and I don't care what the fuck it is. Uh, a lot of times on those nights, I'll either do a shot of this guy, JTS Brown, or a shot of this guy, just because it's cheap and it tastes good, and I'm okay if I knock back a couple shots, and then I'll kind of go just go from there. Um, there'll there'll be some nights where um, feeling really good about things, and I'm kind of on a high note, and I'll go there. There's this guy. That's a wild turkey decades, which is a, a blend of a 10 and 20 year from wild turkey. And then this guy right above it, uh, George Remus, 14 year old bottled and bond from the MGP distillery. Those are kind of like my, my high end whiskeys. And, uh, maybe I'll take a little, a little sip out of that one as well. Um, but I have, I was counting, counting before I started and I have like over a hundred bottles that are open. So it, it just kind of, it kind of depends where my mood's sitting, man. It, what I drink on, on a, on a nightly or weekly or monthly basis definitely has a lot to, to play on what my mood is at, at the time. So, so I've got some, I bought some uh, Wolf Reserve Double Oat, mm -hmm. which I think is the best bourbon I've tried, man. Like, mm. Like, what does that mean? Like, to be double oak, what does that even mean? I don't even know. Like, I don't know. So, uh, Woodford double oaked is you – so, bourbon sits in a barrel, and it ages. And then, after it hits maturity, it gets bottled. Doubled oak hits maturity, and then it goes into another barrel, and it sits for six months or a year. I can't remember because you have – Woodford doubled oak, and you have Woodford double doubled oak, and double doubled is double of what the regular process is. So it's either six months or a year. So if it's six months, that means double double is a year, and if it's a year, that means double double is two years. So I can't quite remember which one's which. So double doubled oak is <laughs> double oak is essentially it's just going into another barrel, and it's aging for an X amount of time. So you're getting a lot of those. And then the barrel is usually extra charred too. So you're getting a lot of those, those sugars, you know, you char a barrel, you get a lot of the sugars that are in the oak. So, so all those, you know, the char, the tannins, the sugars, you're getting like a double dose of that that you would normally get with just regular bourbon. Can we do a toast, man? Hell yeah, man. Absolutely. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, for someone like myself, I, I'm not a, a big drinker. I don't drink very much. You know, if I do drink, it's usually a beer or two here and there. 
but I actually, it, it's just funny because I, you know, lately I have quite a bit of bourbon here that people have given me over the years for Christmas gifts and things like that. And I thought, you know, what if I wanted to try, you know, and actually start, you know, trying different bourbons and do, sure. like, where would you recommend somebody even start? Like, you know, is there, I know that's probably, it's different for everybody, but if you were just kind of given a, a broad answer, like, yeah, do try, you know, try a few of these out and, and then go from there. I would, I would say entry level. I think the best place is going to start is you're going to be low proof and low rye. So either uh, a bourbon with low rye content or a bourbon that doesn't have any rye content at all. So like a weeded bourbon, uh, entry level bourbons that are, are weeded, uh, maker's mark. That's the big one. That's a weeded bourbon. Um, Old Fitzgerald from Heaven Hill, um, Weller from Buffalo Trace. Uh, Weller's not a terrible bourbon. It's it's just really hard to come by, and the amount of effort that you have to put into finding a bottle versus its price, I don't think it's worth it when there's plenty of other things on the shelf that are just as good. So that would be that would be my thing. Um, I would say like an Old Fitzgerald eighty proof, low proof. No rye content at all. Um, JTS Brown, I kind of go into that afterwards. That's kind of like a step up in proof. Uh, you have really low rye content. I think they're like 12 or 13% rye. Um, Eagle Rare. Eagle Rare, that's another good one. I tried that. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great one. Low, lower rye content. Um, 90 proof. So yeah, just, once again, like just because it's 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 just because it's low proof doesn't always mean that it's not going to be spicy. I have a I have a bourbon from New Jersey. Uh, shout out to uh, Penelope Bourbon. This is an eighty proof bourbon, it's but it's a high a high rye bourbon. Uh, so even though it's an eighty proof, it still has you know a good amount of spice. Um, in it. So yeah, I would say lower proof and lower rise are really a good place to get started. If you're, you know, interested in bourbon, you kind of want to jump off into it. It's really a good place to start. So Timothy, I seen these guys, even that bourbon, bourbon finders group that we're in together, and they're doing these uh, smoke boxes. Mm -hmm. Like, so what is that about? Like, they're just trying to get a smoky flavor into the drink. Is that what that is? It's it's gen it's usually a smoked old fashioned. Yeah. And all they're doing is they're either smoking, smoking what's in the glass, or they're smoking the glass itself. It's yeah, it's just a, it's just a, another uh, adding another level to your drink. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's just ele elevating your drinking experience essentially. Like I, I'm so thank you for coming on, man. Like I, yeah, I, dude, absolutely. I'm so fascinated right now. Like you think it's not here, but it's not totally caught up in it. <laughs> well, I'm uh, just waiting. Me. I'm just waiting for the next time we get together because I think JD normally he he skips a whole bunch of steps. Like he goes from step <laughs> one to right to the goal, right? So I'm expecting next time we're together for him to be, you know, holding it up around, you know, both sides of his nose and telling us that oh, this is this is oak forward. <laughs> I'm not going to say that's not going to happen. <laughs> And look, I've come up, you know, and I want to thank JD for, you know, getting up with you and, and having you come on. Of course, thank you, yeah, man. But JD, you really um, dropped the ball when we could have went to Louisville and just done it right there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm going to be myself. Hang on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think we're going to have to take just that bourbon on the road. No, and uh, come to Louisville and hang out with Timothy. Absolutely, I'm about that 100. percent Hell yeah, let's do that. That's that sounds like a great idea for sure. Cool. So Timothy, we we try to hold this to about an hour, so we're about out of time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Once again, man, we do we we really appreciate you coming on. So tell everybody where they can you know find your stuff and talk a little bit yeah, about the website. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you can find uh, my reviews as far as. Uh, yeah, I think I have like five or six colleagues that are also uh, writing at modernthirst.com. Uh, we really do our best to try to stay uh, on top of things and, re and release at least one or two things a week. So you check us out there at modernthirst.com. 
Uh, you can follow me personally on Instagram. I'm at single barrel snob kind of touching on back what we were talking about earlier. I'm obsessed with single barrels. So yeah, single barrel snob. Um, yeah. And just go check out, you know, just go check out the website on uh, at modern thirst, check out the about us section and you can, you know, go and follow everyone else that writes on the site too. It has all, all their contact information and uh, you know, all the, all the information about the site as well. Cause I noticed on the side, it's not just bourbon. I mean, I think they, there's I uh, saw something about beer, you know, different beers, yeah. craft beers, oh, yeah. different things like that. So I mean, there's all kinds of cool stuff on there. Yeah, it really, that. it really is more or less covering, uh, I'd say almost every aspect as far as, you know, um, being this business goes, there's, there's a writer that kind of specializes in every little category. So yeah, it's not just bourbon. There's bourbon, there's scotch, there's whiskey, um, All right, George. You know, there's there's stuff that's limited to a certain region. There's <laughs> recipes. There's beer. Yeah, there's there's all kinds of different things going on on that website. It's not just whiskey and bourbon. JD Kenny Tackett wants to come with us. Can we allow that? Yeah. Uh, bird dog. I don't know, bro. We got we got to talk. I don't, you shake your yeah. beer. Can't go. We got to have a beer. <laughs> All of a sudden, our, our mentions when we mentioned actually coming to Louisville and doing taste testing with this guy, like our, our mentions on here just like shot up. Can I come? Can I come? <laughs> Hell yeah! <laughs> yep. <laughs> there is room for everybody. The more, the merrier. Uh, Absolutely. Appreciate you, Tim. Thanks, man. And I, and yeah, I swear, man. boys, when we you know we talked about doing this, and I was like, man, I don't know, you know, what I'm really going to ask. And I have been fascinated for this entire hour. Like I'm like. This yeah. is the coolest thing ever. This is so much fun. What was the drink so, and I was too. <laughs> <laughs> so, got any more questions for Timothy, guys, before we shut it down? That's All right, cool. Timothy, Thanks for coming again. on, Timothy. Yeah, appreciate Thanks, you, brother. Man. Yeah, absolutely. And for those of you that are watching us, um, check us out this Sunday. Uh, we'll get back to doing our normal podcast here pretty soon, but we have a gentleman that's running for state senate here in our area, Glenn Martin Hammond. He's uh, one of the Democratic candidates. Uh, that'll be coming up in this election here June 23rd. He'll be on with us. Um, but of course, uh, you can find us on Podbean. That's where we launch our podcast from. You can pick us up on iTunes, on Spotify, YouTube. Go and check out some of these other interviews we've been doing. We've done a lot of cool stuff. Uh, you can go to YouTube and watch the videos there. Um, and of course, as we always end our show, from myself, from JD, from Brad, and tonight, Timothy, no matter how bad your week's been, no matter how bad your day's going, if you just add birth, it always gets a little bit better. Thanks for hanging out, guys. Thanks, Brad.